everyone, and welcome to Anne Lee 520, or Natural Language Processing. I'm Dr. Erin Buchanan, and I'll be the lecturer for the videos for this course. All right, so what is this course about? Well, in this course, you'll learn a lot about natural language processing. And so this is used in the very traditional sense of NLP. It's not just sentiment analysis. We're going to cover a broad range of topics from NLP. You'll learn how to perform statistics on text, on structured data, and language, which is a very messy thing to deal with. So how do we go from large bodies of text to an understanding of what's in that text? So what else are we going to learn? Well, you will be able to define natural language processing. Students will be able to identify key concepts of computing with language and they'll be able to explain the relevance of NLP to current technological needs. So why should you even learn NLP, right? So these are our learning objectives for the course. We'll also be able to install and experiment with natural language processing tools. We will do this in both R and Python. All right, now in my traditional like class part of this, we'll go over the syllabus. I won't bore you with the syllabus here because it might change, but the syllabus includes all the course policies and other important information about the actual class. We will use Canvas for all of our class related things. If you're just here for the show, you don't have to do either of these things. So this is for my students. <clears throat> and then I would normally pause right here and go over all of that. So in the first real class, we will go over these pieces. Now, for the writing for the course, for the several projects that are due, you will write reports with code and text embedded. So you'll get to see how to use Markdown to incorporate both R and Python and look at the code and look at their outputs. You'll also work on interpreting those outputs. And anytime you use someone else's work, you should use APA style for the uh, <clears throat> citations as, or at least your best guess, because APA is complicated. <laughs> Both in-text citations and reference pages are required, so check this out. Um, refer to this link here, which will take you to apastyle.org. But here's a couple of examples um, about including a reference in text okay, and a reference just on the reference page. Okay. Um, I also recommend Night Sight. Knight, like Knight in Shining Armor is a really great place you can type in the information and get it spit out in APA style. Okay. Or you can use plugins like Zotero that actually work, uh, integrate within Markdown to do citations. Okay. So on to the real stuff. What is NLP? Well, NLP stands for Natural Language Processing. Okay. It has roots in computer science, artificial intelligence, and linguistics. So I consider NLP the crossword roads of several different fields of computer science, psychology, and co uh, cognitive linguistics. Like we will do some very traditional linguistics linguistics, but as a person whose background is in computational linguistics, um, we'll talk more about cognitive linguistics, or which is a field of psychology. The focus here is on human language. When we will use computer languages, we are gonna focus on human language and how to analyze that data. And then this, the real question becomes, what is language even, right? How do we deal with such a messy construct? And I would argue that many number systems are also messy, but language especially messy because we have different uh, symbol systems for them. So most people consider language a symbol processing system, right? Where the symbols are the squiggles or the sounds that you hear, or if it's visual, Right, so ASL is visual or body, um, you know, body language is also a language in a sense. And so there are symbols here that represent some sort of constructs. And so what we're going to do is use computers to translate those symbols into con other types of constructs. Maybe we'll perform some statistics. Maybe we'll do something as simple as part of speech tagging. So the origins of NLP kind of have a rich history across many fields, but I'll just give you some of the highlights. <clears throat> most people consider the Turing test as one of the most important kind of early pieces for NLP. And this occurred in the approximately the 1950s by Alan Turing. And the idea behind it of the Turing test <clears throat> is that someone would be put in front of a computer 
and they would be either talking to our computer or human. And uh, if they couldn't tell the difference of which is which, then the computer would pass the artificial intelligence test. Okay. And this is actually a competition that happens every year where people try to design chatbots basically that will pass the Turing test. Nothing has really passed the Turing test. Some things have claimed to, but nothing is as good as us as people, right? Um, this also has ties to uh, an occurrence in the 1980s of the called the Chinese Thought Room Experiments by Searle. Same basic idea that if we're having some a human converse with either a human or a machine, if the machine successfully fools a large proportion of people, then it is probably, it is artificially intelligent. Follow this up with what I would consider um, some early cognitive kind of work. So in the 1950s, there were many sort of big conferences thinking about this new computing thing and how we could relate the mind to the computer okay, and then actual computing advances. So the Georgetown experiment, which showed that machine translation was actually possible in Russian, if you think about the time period, that makes a lot of sense, where they were able to have computers successfully translate Russian sentences. And then the 60s is where all the magic happened. So the number and, and breadth of NLP systems began to, to really come to light. And we'll talk about a couple of them in particular. Um, <clears throat> but there was this real growth and in interest, partially because researchers at institutions and universities could essentially get their own computers. They were as big as the room that I'm teaching in right now, but um, they could start to program them themselves, right? And this is really where um, influence of psychology can be seen <clears throat> and computer science, the burgeoning field of computer science. Okay. And so as computational power has increased in computers, so the computers sitting on our desks right now that I'm lecturing to you on are amazingly powerful machines. When we look at the history of computation, the interest in corpus linguistics with the availability of the internet and the incredible interest in machine learning right now, we have just seen a lot of this research really sort of push forward <clears throat> because it is more easily accessible to all kinds of audiences. So a little bit on the artificial intelligence component. That term was first coined by John McCarthy in the 50s. Okay? And it's really been studied for decades now. So what are we approaching 70 years? <laughs> And, you know, I have this sort of bang wow sentence here of it's the most elusive in computer science. So I think if you talk to anyone who works in this field, I would argue that it's very hard to get computers to act really like people because people are fickle and emotional, right? So even some of our best systems like Watson um, don't act like people. They still act like computers. So when we use the term artificial intelligence, there's a broad range of things that people mean, right? So that could be any kind of machine that's programmed to do uh, like a search algorithm or to the ultimate goal capable of thinking like people. And so I think we take for granted many of the systems that are artificially intelligent around us, like our phones, right? Google Maps, <laughs> uh, talking to, um, to assist in doing text, speech to text as many of those systems would be considered artificial intelligence, a simpler version than the ultimate thinking version. But there's a lot of intelligent systems that um, we use so much that we just don't think about as much. Right. So a couple of links here for um, the history of artificial intelligence. So the Turing test here, uh, a little bit more on this. So no one can, you really can't say that computers can't process things, right? That's the whole goal is processing things. If you program them well enough, they can compute things logically. People are not logical, however. So can we, test? you know, does that mean the computer is thinking? Probably not. And that really gets us down to this precise definition of think. And when we talk about language specifically, the argument here is about creativity because humans are very creative with language. Computer systems, not so much. 
Okay, they learn the systematic rules and then repeat those rules. Okay. There are strong oppositions over whether that's even possible to program computers to think like people. Okay. I'd argue well, I'm not convinced yet, <laughs> um, but the Turing test is a, like kind of the long-term goal for AI research for this like high level of research, right? Less practical, but more theoretical. So will we ever be able to build a computer that sufficiently imitates humans to the point where judges who know what's going on, so suspicious judges, right, not just dicking around on the internet, can tell, cannot tell the difference between people and machines? Maybe, maybe one day. Okay. So a little bit more on the Turing test if you're interested. Now moving into the 60s, the research was actually on baseball which is kind of awesome since the World Series just ended <laughs> as I'm recording this. And it was a computer program that was built in two parts. It would answer questions phrased in basic English. Okay. Now this was essentially a system that was designed to read from punch cards. So you can tell what time period this is in, in the sixties. And it would take the sentences, look up the individual words and or idioms in a programmed a dictionary look up the phrase structure. So we're gonna learn about how to deal with phrase structure and other syntactic facts. Syntax is just the structure of the sentence that makes it translate into meaning. And it would say, okay, given the words here and this order of the words mostly, what this sentence is asking is X. And this is very similar to what we would now call like text summarization or content analysis. And it sort of broke them down into these list attribute pairs, right? So it would ask about who played what game. So here's an example. Where did each team play on July 7th? So the attribute value kind of pairs would be play and then date, right? So the play is a location, date is a time. And then it would um, look up the answer based on those value pairs. Okay, so this is a smart, lookup system um, that is not too terribly different from the way that it's like search algorithms work now. Also in the 60s, ELISA is a very famous early system designed by MIT. MIT will come up a lot, okay, by Joseph Weizenbaum in the mid to mid 1960s. And really the original plan was to demonstrate how superficial the communication is between humans and machines. Okay? And by superficial it means very shallow processing, very simple sentences, simple types of concepts and ideas. And so it simulated conversation by using this sort of pattern matching and substitution methodology. If you say, hi, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine. How are you doing? Okay, so we pull the, the, the doing part of this, I'm doing fine. So that's a simple pattern matcher. So matching the verb and substitution. So I can't say you doing fine, that doesn't make sense, right? And so a lot of chatbot systems still kind of use these rules. And it really didn't have any kind of framework for the contextualization of an event. So if you say I'm having a bad day, right, it might suggest like um, my day has been full of work, which isn't quite the response you might expect from someone. If you say I'm having a bad day, someone normally says why, right? So there's not a good contextualization system um, in here in, this, in the 60s. <clears throat> However, the interesting thing that came out of a lot of this, other than the, the concept and the proof of design, is how many people in his lab, including his secretary, that the story goes that the secretary is, is the person that kind of spur, spurred those ideas, um, attributed human-like feelings to the program. And what that means is that the, the, the sort of, um, what mostly we do to animals too, right? We ascribe feelings and thoughts to them. We did this also to machines, which is a little surprising to people, right? And so that is a kind of a famous story on how humans 
interact with machines. Okay. And then um, <clears throat> at the same time that Terry Winograd, also at MIT, was programming a system that was just supposed to understand natural language. Right? And so the goal was to carry on a simple dialogue with the user, this time about specific things on the screen. So helping contextualize what's going on, very controlled environment, unlike the Eliza. Right? And, um, oh, I thought there was more on this slide. What they were able to show was that they could carry out these simple dialogues, but if anything veered off topic, it couldn't carry on, right? So the goal here is to see that they're only good at programming what we, what we've only good at doing what we've programmed, which makes sense, right? But here in the 60s, we we're trying to prove that we can even do this and we show success. You can do this, okay? How good it is, is the question. And now the goal is not, can we do it? It's how far can we push it? <clears throat> So why should we study this kind of stuff? Okay. This is a statistic from a textbook somewhere, so I don't know where it came from, but the idea is that <clears throat> much of big data, I have this in quotes because big depends on who you're talking to, but a lot of data itself is unstructured, okay? And by unstructured, I mean it's not in a nice, neat little table. So language doesn't fit nicely into a little table. You can make it into a little table, but it's naturally unstructured. So <laughs> we have to figure out how to deal with that. And there's a lot of language data out there, right? So images themselves have to be somehow processed and tagged, right? So how does, how does Google know when I'm wanting to search for cute puppies, which pictures to show me, right? Um, videos are also, Kind of the, the double the problem, it's the images and the, the sound. Right. And then any kind of text or recording, um, mostly here we're gonna talk about already, print, already transcribed text, but if you were also talking about transcribing, that's another layer of complexity for NLP systems. And so many people are interested in text analytics, sentiment analysis, Opinion analysis, text mining, there's lots of terms here that mean the same things. So I'm going to try to use NLP to mean any of these processes um, or corpus linguistics, because that to me captures more of what's actually happening. Um, but that is more of a broad term that covers all these other ones. So text mining, right? Opinion analysis, sentiment analysis, part of speech tagging, named entity recognition, dependency parsing. There's a ton of things that are tasks, things I can do that fall under the umbrella of NLP. Okay. And a lot of businesses and researchers are really interested in this kind of work because if I can get a computer to analyze the surveys that I sent out to all of my clients and employees, that's much faster than paying someone to actually read them and interpret them. Okay. So there are a lot of applications that are very important to your day-to-day -day life Right. And so, you know, just simply um, search and using a search engine is an NLP process. So I really want to bring in like how much of this is pervasive throughout the things that you do all day. You just don't think about it. So to do something, some stuff, right, with text mining, for example, it is linguistic because it involves words. It's statistical because uh, much of research is on frequency and a lot of machine learning. So we will do machine learning towards the end of the semester to pull out what is going on in that text. So we're extracting content from the text. Now, so some tra traditional approaches to text analytics behind my face here um, is semantics. So I'm biased, this is my research area. Semantics is understanding the meaning behind a text. So I'm interested in word meaning, but we could think about readability, interest, just how interesting it is. It doesn't have to be students, it could be anybody. <laughs> um, and vocabulary, like what's the reading level for this text? How complicated is this text? Can we make it simpler for people to read? Okay. Now semantics is a really broad field that covers anything that to do with one of word, discourse, text meaning. 
So we could think about text summarization. We could think about uh, topics analysis is very popular. Anything where you're trying to transform that text into a summary or compare two texts, see how similar they are, classify text based on their topics, et cetera. I will say that <laughs> if you don't know the answer, the answer is frequency. Okay, so word frequency predicts many, many cognitive tasks, many things, your understanding, your readability, how much you like the words, how familiar you are with the words. I could go on forever. Word frequency predicts everything. So this is kind of a long running joke that I always talk about with other researchers in this field. I always tell my students, if you don't know, the answer is frequency. And even if it isn't, I might give you a couple of points for remembering that fact. Because word frequency is so critically important to any type of linguistic analysis. Okay, and you'll see that as we go. So we could do this with factor or cluster type analyses. So k-means cl k clustering is kind of a popular way to classify different texts. Um, we could just look at a word cloud that just simply depicts word frequency. We could just think like, how many pages does it have? How many chapters does it have? How many letters does it have? So frequency can be thought about in a bunch of different ways. And this course will mostly focus on frequency as a useful piece of information to help us do other tasks. So for part of speech tagging, where I'm deciding if a word is a noun, a verb, or an adverb, whatever, often it's how frequently is it that particular type of word, right? And that's your best guess. Okay, so kick, most frequently a verb. So might as well guess that it's a verb. So what are we gonna do this semester? Well, we're gonna learn how to process raw text in our first couple of weeks. This is arguably one of the most difficult parts of any type of analysis. Just like in statistics, when you have to use data cleaning and explore your data, make sure everything looks okay, you'll spend a lot more time doing that than the actual analysis. So when I run my statistical analyses, often the data cleanup code is hundreds of lines long. And then the uh, statistical analysis is four. <laughs> and that is not too far off from how we're gonna work um, in, in NLP as well. So a lot of data wrangling for the first couple of weeks. We'll talk about part of speech tagging, very traditional NLP task. And for a long time was, was like the thing to prove that you could do. I think we have this down pretty well now. We'll talk about parsing, right? So traditional constituency parsing and dependency parsing, which is the more the newer and more popular way to do this. Then entity recognition, which is a task that still needs a lot of a lot of research on. Um, entity recognition is extracting the names, and dates, and places from a text. Uh, dependency parsing, which should have been with the last one, <laughs> but we'll we'll do both uh, types of parsing. Classification skills, which is arguably the, the thing people are most interested in because it, you can also use that to do sentiment. So we're building our way up to sentiment analysis by starting with a traditional um, sort of base of what you can do. But if you're in the class and you're doing the assignments, I really want you to see that there's not a reason to skip these first couple steps because there's a lot that part of speech tagging alone can tell you. So if you can perform part of speech tagging on your data, then that will often give you a good feel for what's in the data before you even get to sentiment. So these are not individual tasks that you just sort of do one at a time. They often can be used in conjunction to help you perform other tasks or to simply analyze your text. All right, I think there's a lot of, um, people wanna jump straight to a machine learning task without thinking about like the other things that are available to you in your toolkit. So <clears throat> I just wanna give you some examples and kind of explore this topic a little bit more. And so any type of text analytics, right, is the use of a computer to process human or natural language. So when someone came up with the phrase natural language processing, I'm, you know, it's sort of meant to capture that we're using people speak and not computers speak. 
and that's what it's supposed to mean. I think they should have just called it human language processing, but I'm also biased. Okay. Computational linguistics, which is what my, I would argue that I do, okay, is thinking about language from a computational focus or a computer science focus. Uh, many people in computational linguistics are also in the cognitive sciences like myself, not everybody, but a lot of us. So that is, gives you a background in psychology. Okay. Uh, machine learning is algor algorithms, math, applied to a specific task, like classifying or processing text. Okay. And so there's something inherently special about machine learning as much as people like sort of are fascinated with it right now. It's a statistical procedure um, applied to build a model that then does some task for you. So part of speech tagging is technically a machine learning problem, right? It's a, some sort of statistical procedure, analyzing frequency, logistic regression, right? Um, some newer, more crazy ones <clears throat> like gradient boosting or random forest applied to some sort of model of the data, right? What's the most important features in the data? to produce an output that you're interested in. So part of speech tagging is a well-known machine learning problem. We could think about information retrieval. So this is we look up systems, right? So Googling, that requires a lot of text processing on the front end to understand what you're asking for and on the back end to matching you to the things that um, answer your question <coughs> or your search. Me. <clears throat> so some simple terms to know for the semester. And the first big one is going to be corpus. We're going to talk about corpora, multiple, all the semester. They are <coughs> the backbone to a good NLP system. So a lot of the tasks we're going to do are supervised tasks, meaning we have to have some sort of data to build our models on. And corpora are the answer to that question. Okay, so corpus is just a broad term for any body of linguistic data. Okay. And so here's an example of the corpus of contemporary American English. So let's check out COCA as it's known. And I thought I, could, I, thought I had the link here. Oh, did COCA go away? Well, that's no fun. Let's look at iWeb then. All right. So iWeb is um, a similar to the Corpus of Contemporary American English. However, this is the one that's on the internet. Right. So within it, you can search for any of your favorite words or phrases. We're gonna go cheese because it's one of my favorite words. Okay. And then apparently they will now make you log in and register. So let's go back and look at the picture that I bookmarked quite some time ago where I had searched for the word cheese and it would show me the word frequency. Okay, so in COCA, the word cheese comes up almost 25,000 times. And then within that, I could click on it and look at the um, places and types of occurrences where it happens. Okay. And then I could do even more with COCA <coughs> if I had the entire data set. All right. And you can spend some time looking at um, the available corpora that are on this website, it does look like it is still free, um, but you do I'd have to log in and I don't remember my password. <laughs> so you get the idea here. Now the corpora that we'll work with, we'll either download or we'll use an NLTK package because it's available. So some examples of what we can do with these large text data sets. Uh, other than lots of stuff, right? So the most common things that people do with them is use them as ways to build part of speech taggers. Stimmers, okay, a stimmer is something that um, extracts, takes off the um, prefixes and suffixes the, of, of words. So uh, stimming, I would take off the ing because it's a an affix to a word, maybe an ed or an s or so common um, ways that we um, change words to past tense or present future tense, etc. Limitization is where we go from the um, the different form of the word to the root word. So like we would go from running to run or went 
to go, right? Which is a much more difficult task because especially in English, there are a lot of irregular words. Another thing you'll learn this semester is that English is a weird language. <laughs> and so there are a lot of complexities when analyzing it because the joke is that it's three languages in a trench coat pretending to be one. We'll also learn how to make grammars, right? So building our own sentences and understanding the, what words do. So this is the parsing and named its derecognition part. We can also use corpora as our backbone for any type of classification task, as long as it has the right data available to us. So some popular corpora. I always joke that Brown is the most overused corpus. For a long time, it was the only one that was really available. It was first printed as a book, if that tells you anything. It's from the 1950s or the 1960s, somewhere in there. And it has texts in like fiction, magazines, news. And so people used it to help classify text, to help part of speech taggers. Like we'll use Brown just so you can see kind of what it does and what it looks like. The Lob Corpus, which was the British answer to the Brown Corpus, so it's a British English data set. The Child's or Talk Bank Corpus, which is really fascinating because it's children's speech rather than adult reading speech or reading text. A WordNet, we'll spend a lot of time talking about WordNet. It's a hierarchically structured database. So this is useful because it is um, it explains the relationships between words. Tree bank, there are many tree banks. Most of the data I've talked about so far is only in English. The nice thing about tree banks is there are tree banks in many, many, many languages now, which is really awesome. Um, and those corpora are usually used for limitization. So it's a dictionary lookup and part of speech tagging. The Reuters corpus is a famous news articles corpus. The American and British national corpus, COCA, which I tried to show you a second ago, and <clears throat> And Google's engrams are all very large English text corpora. Google also has uh, ones in Spanish and a couple other Chinese, Hebrew, that you can search. So if you Google engram, it'll take you to their viewer. Okay. Now, the newer thing is to have corpora that are based on internet speech. So there are many of these emails, Usenet, tweets, Reddit. Um, Amazon reviews, movie reviews, Yelp reviews. I'm just thinking of all the more popular ones. And these are um, often hosted on Kaggle, uh, but are really useful for sentiment and analysis. A lot of them have sentiment tagged in it, um, but also just seeing how we're using language differently from you know your sort of traditional book and news corpora to actual like human interaction right so if you if we look at reddit that's going to be very different than let's say um any of our regular text corpora right and so we can really track how language is changing over time as well <clears throat> so a couple of other things we're going to use a lot i'm going to use tokens and types um as a term quite a bit Tokens are just each individual piece of a text, right? So generally we think about tokens as words. And so we're counting the number of words that are available in the text. Excuse me, I'm a, some sort of tree blooming. <clears throat> um, and tokens are really, it's really useful to know how many. Now in English, this is easy because we put a space between words, but in things like Korean, that's a little bit harder. So when we think about tokens, we generally mean concepts. Um, we could think about tokens as the number of phrases as well. Um, <clears throat> but it's not always as easy as, as like space processing. So we've got to really think about this outside of English. I'm mostly going to show you work in English because that's what I speak. But uh, other languages do have to handle these things quite differently. Types, however, is the number of distinct tokens. So a, to, um, a, a type to token ratio tells you how lexically, lexically diverse a text is. And so if we use a lot of very different words, the text is more complicated than if you're using the same words over and over again. 
Now, verbs are what they are and prepositions are what they are. So some words are clearly going to repeat, but uh, texts that have a lot more unique words are harder to read because there's lots of different things going on. So like textbooks. And then the other kind of cool thing we can do with this is create these frequency distributions. Okay, frequency distributions is just kind of a, a count of how many times each word, unique word appears. So it's a type to token table. So here are all the types, right? All the distinct pieces. And here's how many times they happen. And that is the simplest way to do any kind of either sentiment or content analysis. Because the words that come up the most frequent are what the text is about. Okay, so yes, I can program all these fancy models, but I can also just make a table. And down here, I didn't make a table, I actually made a graph here. This is from the English Lexicon Project, which was a, a large um, study of how fast people could read words. But one thing that it has in there is the subtitle frequencies. So the open subtitles corpus is a large corpus of sub movie subtitles in many languages. And I can just show you what the most popular words are. Okay. Now, this is not the entire data set because it's really quite large, but just here's a random sampling. Okay. First thing you want to see here is a, this is this uh, kind of power function. This is called Zipf's law. Zipf's law is that the frequency of events will always make this sort of curve. Okay. And so you'll see this kind of picture quite a bit. <laughs> um, but, but clearly the most frequent word here is C, which is a common verb. Okay. Now, these other words are just the ones that happen to be in this particular sampling of the data set. Um, but simply, we could say that most of the words that people are talking about, whoops, um, in subtitles in English is seeing something, which is a word we use a, a lot during the day. Okay. And then you can also see that I've uh, opened up Python here in the background and it spat out what my Python one is. So this is one thing, I didn't mean to print this out, but here's one thing I do want you to get. We're gonna use R, so I showed you here, this is an R chunk um, that is building this graph okay. and Python inter somewhat interchangeably throughout the semester. And so this part is Python. Now I have all of these labeled here in Markdown because even though in the slides, when I am typing them up, I have to label the chunks and what type they are. It doesn't print out. <laughs> so at the top of each one of these, I have which language this is written in. It's not necessary to make this code work. It's just practically useful for the slideshow to show you which language I am currently showing you. Okay. So you'll see me all of them labeled Python chunk and R chunk at the top because students many moons ago when I first taught this were like, we can't tell which language this is, please label it. <laughs> so I did. Okay. Now, with that frequency information, I can make two what's called a dispersion plot. And I think these are really underused. Now, NLTK's version of this is a little simplistic. I think you could probably make much prettier plots than ggplot or go full matplotlib if you're going to use Python. But NLTK has a base option for this that you can make them kind of quick and easy. And they just tell you so much information and people don't use them as much as I think they should. And I'm not gonna talk a whole lot about code right now because we're gonna start in on code hard next week. But let's say if I wanna print out um, using the inauguration corpus, text four here. So this is the inaugural address corpus. I think it runs up to Bush two. Okay. And so that has some sort of time component to it, right? So if we put them all in order, and then pretend the text is also time locked. What we get across the bottom of a dispersion plot is word offset. And so we can think about this as across time. Then we tell it what words we want to look at across time. And it simply makes a little tick mark every time that happens. So I could simply look at what were the words that were most important to people that they got used in the inaugural corp address corpus. Okay. Now, citizens is pretty consistently used more early on and then more lately. Okay. Democracy, almost never used, surprisingly. 
until we get more into time periods with wars. Freedom, me, 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 very popular word now. Duty, duty to one's country, du country duties. Not, you know, more popular early, not so much now. So we've switched from duties to freedom. Okay. And then America, because this is the US inaugural dress corpus, me, 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 very popular now. Okay. So we can see these trends and what's important thematically by simply plotting um, nouns here. Uh, across time. So again, I'm really trying to hit home that you don't always need a super complex analysis to understand what's going on. Some good pictures and some good tables will tell you a lot about what's happening in the text. And all of those are based on frequency. So again, if you don't know the answer, the answer is frequency. So um, let's talk more about frequency. So we'll look a little bit at like collocations, which is a fancy phrase for how often words occur together in text. So everything I've shown you so far has been about individual words, one word at a time, but we can also think about phrases and bigrams of so pairs of words together. So anytime words collocate, they're in the same sentence, in the same paragraph, in the same document. Okay. This will be more towards the end of the semester. Oops. And ingrams are in number of words that occur together. Okay, so this is a picture of Google's ingrams viewer. And I, uh, at this point in American English, plotted linguistic natural language processing as individual words. And what we see is that processing kind of um, change, is increasing over time. I imagine that this word actually goes up more, but it's sort of this peaking in the, in the 90s. And this is when home computing became very popular. Linguistic has kind of come up and leveled out. Um, uh, language has come up quite a bit. And you see language more often in the late 90s. And so if we looked at the whole phrase, I bet we would see that it's increasing slowly. Now, the fun thing to do with this is you can, you can do all kinds of cool graphs. I think um, the guy who writes XKCD has like a whole list of his favorite graphs on there. Um, and think about what time period you were interested in. Like you could cut off the 1800s here. Um, so one thing I like to show students is um, the, the trends for using uh, things like Malcolm X. You can really show the cultural effects of, of his presence across time. So that's a good one to Google. And then there's a really great video from the guys who put together this, this um, in Grand Viewer, uh, what can we learn from 50 billion books or whatever it is, but it's a TED talk on the In Grand Viewer. And they show you some really cool stuff that they call culturomics. All right, <clears throat> so what can we do? What are we gonna do? Well, some simple basic statistics. And we'll show you how to compute counts. Okay. Almost everything I have shown you so far has been about counts. So just again, highlighting frequency is important. I could calculate lexical diversity. This is the percent of types to tokens ratio. And it tells me how, how many different types of words you're using in a text. So it's a very simplistic way to get at complexity, text complexity. There are other ways to do this, like readability measures. Um, there's a really famous one called Flesh Kincaid that tells you what grade level a reading a text is at. But if you're trying to make your website simple so people understand it, you might be interested in this. You can think about dispersion. So across time, what characters occur together, that kind of thing. We could calculate word sense disambiguation. This is getting harder now. And that is the fact that words have multiple meanings. So we'll talk about what's called polysemy all semester. Okay. Polysemy is this idea that an individual word may have many meanings, poly meaning multiple, right? <clears throat> and so how do I know which one they meant, right? Bank, which is a, the most famous example of words of multiple meanings, has like 20 different definitions. So like, how do you pick which one they meant? Right? And that is um, a difficult task because you have to think about word context. So here's an example. Serve might mean to help food or drink. So someone's serving you dinner, right? Might mean to hold an office. It might mean to be in the military or in tennis, it means to put the ball into play. Dish could mean a plate, 
could mean the course of the meal, could mean dish TV. Okay. And there are many more examples here. So especially in English, words have lots of meanings. Could think about context clues, right? So here's an example. <clears throat> the lost children were found by the searchers. So it's an agent that's doing the finding. The lost children were found by the mountains. It's the location of where the finding is happening. Or the lost children were found by the afternoon. Okay, that's a time lock on what is happening. So the, here we're using the context of the direct object of the sentence, found by whom, uh, where, or when, right? So we're answering the W questions. That's a little different than um, meaning based on context. Okay, I'm sorry, meaning based on, um, on straight dictionary context. Uh, I could think about pronoun resolution. This is where you are trying to determine the links between things and sentences. So pronouns, I, you, they, this, that, okay. I, um, many moons ago, my advisor would circle every uh, ambiguous pronoun in my, in my text, just to make me realize like how bad I was at doing it. Um, the noun that this refers to is sometimes called the antecedent. And this is a popular thing to do in like works of fiction to purposely be vague okay, to keep you on your toes. Okay, or it was bad writing, one of the two. Uh, so an example, the thieves stole the paintings. They were subsequently sold. Okay, what does they refer to in this sentence? Most people say paintings because paintings are sold. People can be sold too though. So they, here is an ambiguous uh, pronoun. But most agree this paintings. Could, however, say they were subsequently caught. Well, you don't catch paintings, they're not running away, right? So instead, we're gonna say the thieves are the ones that were caught. Or we could go totally ambiguous and go either way where they were subsequently found. So we could have found the paintings, or we could have found the thieves, or both. And so resolving what they means is disambiguating which context to use. From that, we could start to build our own text. Okay, so we could do question and answer type systems where um, somebody types something in and we give it an answer. Okay, so who sold the paintings? Okay. Uh, we could do machine translation. So going from one language to another. This is still a very difficult task. Um, look at Google Translate fails. We've gotten better at it. And Google has an amazing system but it's still a difficult task because we tend to use a lot of slang when we're speaking and we don't always speak in proper grammar. <laughs> so um, it's, you know, sometimes there, it's lo it is literally lost in translation. Okay. We could start to build spoken systems. So speech to text systems, things that talk back to you and those really bad phone systems where you're like, just give me somebody, anybody, a human, <laughs> right? Um, so things like Siri, Google, uh, and there are more of them, but those are the big two. So I stole this picture from the NLTK book because it's the wrong way. It is easily one of the best conceptualizations of how much can go into a single NLP system. So we could start with speech analysis. Okay. Speech analysis requires a morphological and lexical analysis. Okay, morphemes are the individual units in a word. So cats has two morphemes, cat, that's the meaning of the noun and meaning more than one. Okay. Not all words are multiple morphemes, but you do have to process those morphemes to know if it's in past tense, future tense, uh, plurality, subject verb agreement, et cetera. Then we were breaking things down into parsing. Parsing tells us, is it a noun, is it a verb? How are the objects related to each other in this sentence? Contextual reasoning, like what the heck is going on? This is semantics. And then regular reasoning. So if I said, what's for dinner? I have to have some sort of reasoning and execution thinking about what is a proper answer to that. Okay, you shouldn't say cars are for dinner, right? You should say pizza is for dinner. But after you figure that out, you have to go back the other way where you are planning an utterance. So for us, that might be speaking, but the computer is planning the text. Okay. You have to plan that syntactically correct to put the words in the right order. 
you have to match their subject verb agreement. And then if it's speech, you say it aloud or you type it out. Okay. And so each one of these boxes is an individual field of study all on its own. Okay. There are people who work in phonological recognition systems. Okay. And then there are people who study semantics like me. But um, true NLP systems cover the whole range. So we're gonna break these pieces down one at a time to show you how to put them together. All right, a couple more things we can do here. And so an example of a task that covers all of those, right, is textual entailment. Okay, entailment's pretty complex. What you're doing is you have a, a set of, of text inputs to get into the system and then you ask the system a question. And the system has to say, yes, I can logically answer that question given those inputs or no. Basically, is it true or false? So an example, <clears throat> this particular person is the author of 18 books, over 150 responses, um, articles, sermons, and books. Okay. There's a hypothesis that the person has written 18 books. Okay. You and I find it very simple to go, uh, duh, it says it right there. Okay. However, a textual entailment system has to basically show that the hypothesis is answerable from the text. Okay. And this is a big competition every year to think about good systems. Many of them are designed based on pattern matching. Okay. 18 books occurs in both of them, so the question must be answerable. But good, good the new good, so one, two, three, the newer systems that are any good also think about semantics and context. Okay, not simple word overlap. All right, so some final thoughts here. So we've just like kind of like touched here and there on some very basic NLP context, kind of just a broad overview, some random things that you can think about and sort of some evidence that we don't have to do anything too crazy to understand what's in a text. And we looked at how we might apply those. So the, the big picture here at the end of like all of these smaller components, each week we're gonna talk about each little piece can play into a bigger and larger system. And the next step for you, those of you in my class, is to set up your computer for the semester. So installing all that R and Python stuff, making sure all of your packages are up and running. So next week, when we start talking about processing raw text, you can follow along.